important principles of Einstein's general relativity is the equivalence principle. It says that all objects, regardless of their mass and composition, would accelerate in the same manner in the same gravitational field when no external forces act upon them. Confused? Let me put it in simple words. Suppose you simultaneously drop a feather and a stone towards the ground from the same height in a perfectly resistance-less environment. Which one, according to you, will touch the ground first? One may think that as a stone is more massive than a fragile feather, it should experience more gravitational force, and hit the ground first. But that's not the case because as per the principle of equivalence, both objects should fall simultaneously on the ground. In other words, one can say that the inertial and gravitational mass of a body is proportional to each other, which makes the acceleration independent of the physical nature of the body. Now, what is the difference between inertial mass and gravitational mass? The mass that appears in Newton's second law of motion is termed inertial mass. It simply describes how difficult it is to accelerate an object. On the other hand, the mass that appears in Newton's universal law of gravitation is the gravitational mass. It depicts the strength with which gravity acts on a body. So although a stone has more gravitational mass than a feather, the force of gravity acting on it is greater. At the same time, its inertial mass is also greater, which makes it difficult to accelerate. So the two effects cancel out, and it falls with the same acceleration as that of the feather which is precisely the value of acceleration due to gravity in free fall. No matter how small, if there's any violation in the proportionality between inertial and gravitational mass, Einstein's entire system breaks down. In 1997, a French woman named Jeanne Calmont passed away after 122 years and 164 days on this earth, making her the oldest known person in history. Her age was so astounding that a millionaire pledged million to anyone who could break her record. But in reality, living to this age or beyond is a feat that very few, maybe even no humans, are likely to accomplish. Human bodies just aren't built for extreme aging. Our capacity is set at about 90 years. But what does aging really mean and how does it counteract the body's efforts to stay alive? We know intuitively what it means to age. For some, it means growing up, while for others, it's growing old. Yet finding a strict scientific definition of aging is a challenge. What we can say is that aging occurs when intrinsic processes and interactions with the environment, like sunlight, and toxins in the air, water, and our diets, cause changes in the structure and function of the body's molecules and cells. Those changes in turn drive their decline, and subsequently, the failure of the whole organism. The exact mechanisms of aging are poorly understood. But recently, scientists have identified nine physiological traits, ranging from genetic changes to alterations in a cell's regenerative ability that play a central role.
So, what can we do to become better listeners? At its core, listening in a one-on-one conversation is about taking an interest in another person and making them feel understood. There's no universally agreed upon definition of high-quality listening, but some recurring features include attentiveness, conveying understanding, and showing a positive intention towards the speaker. This doesn't mean you can simply go through the motions. Researchers have found that merely smiling and nodding at set intervals doesn't quite work. However, there is something slightly performative about listening in that it's important to show you're doing it. So, in addition to actively attending to a speaker's words, good listeners also use questions and body language that indicate their understanding and the desire to understand. This might feel awkward at first, and what's most effective might depend on your relationship with the speaker. But with time and practice you can internalize these basic behaviors. So the first thing to notice is that while the mechanical clocks that we make, even your quartz watch can tell time across a vast range of scales from tens of milliseconds to hours minutes and days and months and years. So the brain has many different clocks in order to tell the milliseconds and seconds and to tell the time of days. So one way to think about it is the circadian clock, the clock that tells you what time of day it is and when to arise and when to go to sleep. That doesn't have a minute hand, much less a second hand. In contrast the clock that tells you, the timing device in your brain that tells you, hmm, this red light is taking a bit too long to turn. This traffic light is taking a bit long to turn, or, I think the waiter forgot my coffee. That clock doesn't have an hour hand much less number of days that have gone by. So the brain has different areas, different mechanisms in order to tell time. We don't understand, fully understand, how the brain tells you what the tempo of a song is or when the red light is going to change. But it doesn't seem to have to do with any oscillator counter mechanisms. It seems to do with neural dynamics which is the fact that patterns of neurons neurons are coupled to each other, neurons are connected next to each other. And when you activate some neurons that group of neurons can activate another group of neurons which can active another group of neurons. So you can have these evolving patterns of neural activity.
Evidence shows that a simple view of nature can radically improve health outcomes. So why couldn't we design a hospital where every patient had a window with a view? Simple, site-specific designs can make a hospital that heals. Designing it is one thing; getting it built, we learned, is quite another.、Uh, we worked with Bruce Nize, a brilliant engineer, and he thought about construction differently than I had been taught in school. When we had to excavate this enormous hilltop, and a bulldozer was expensive and hard to get to site, Bruce suggested doing it by hand, using a method. In Rwanda, called Ubudehe, which means community works for the community, hundreds of people came with shovels and hoes, and we excavated that hill in half the time and half the cost of that bulldozer. Instead of importing furniture, Bruce started a guild, and he brought in master carpenters to train others on how to make furniture by hand. And on this job site, 15 years after the Rwandan genocide, Bruce insisted that we bring on labor from all backgrounds, and that half of them be women. Bruce was using the process of building to heal, not just for those who were sick, but for the entire community as a whole. We call this the locally fabricated way of building, or LoFab, and it has、uh, four pillars: hire locally, source regionally, train where you can, and most importantly, think about every design decision as an opportunity to invest in the dignity of the places and where you serve. Think of it like the local food movement, but for architecture. And、we're convinced that this way of building can be replicated across the world and change the way that we talk about and evaluate architecture. And there are many benefits of moral outrage, but there are also many costs. So the benefits can fall into two broad categories. The first category of benefit is social benefits. So when we express outrage about some kind of wrongdoing, that teaches others that that kind of behavior is not going to be tolerated, and it can motivate other people to behave morally so that they can avoid getting shamed or punished for breaking the rules. The other kind of benefit that moral outrage brings out is personal. Moral outrage broadcasts to the rest of your social group that you are the kind of person who is not likely to break the rules. So these two benefits of expressing outrage have to be balanced against the costs of outrage.
There are many theories that attempt to quantify the number of hours, days, and even years of practice that it takes to master a skill. While we don't yet have a magic number, we do know that mastery isn't simply about the amount of hours of practice. It's also the quality and effectiveness of that practice. Effective practice is consistent, intensely focused, and targets content or weaknesses that lie at the edge of one's current abilities. So if effective practice is the key, how can we get the most out of our practice time? Try these tips. Focus on the task at hand. Minimize potential distractions by turning off the computer or TV and putting your cell phone on airplane mode. In one study, researchers observed 260 students studying. On average, those students were able to stay on task for only six minutes at a time. Laptops, smartphones, and particularly Facebook were the root of most distractions. Start out slowly or in slow motion. Coordination is built with repetitions, whether correct or incorrect. If you gradually increase the speed of the quality repetitions, you have a better chance of doing them correctly. Next, frequent repetitions with allotted breaks are common practice habits of elite performers. Studies have shown that many top athletes, musicians, and dancers spend 50 to 60 hours per week on activities related to their craft. Many divide their time used for effective practice into multiple daily practice sessions of limited duration. And finally, practice in your brain in vivid detail. How do schools of fish swim in harmony? And how do the tiny cells in your brain give rise to the complex thoughts, memories, and consciousness that are you? Oddly enough, those questions have the same general answer, emergence, or the spontaneous creation of sophisticated behaviors and functions from large groups of simple elements. Like many animals, fish stick together in groups, but that's not just because they enjoy each other's company. It's a matter of survival. Schools of fish exhibit complex swarming behaviors that help them evade hungry predators, while a lone fish is quickly singled out as easy prey. So which brilliant fish leader is the one in charge? Actually, no one is, and everyone is. So what does that mean? While the school of fish is elegantly twisting, turning, and dodging sharks in what looks like deliberate coordination, each individual fish is actually just following two basic rules that have nothing to do with the shark. 1. Stay close, but not too close to your neighbor, and 2. Keep swimming. As individuals, the fish are focused on the minutiae of these local interactions, but if enough fish join the group, something remarkable happens. The movement of individual fish is eclipsed by an entirely new entity. The school, which has its own unique set of behaviors. The school isn't controlled by any single fish. It simply emerges if you have enough fish following the right set of local rules. It's like an accident that happens over and over again, allowing fish all across the ocean to reliably avoid predation.
what is bipolar disorder. The word bipolar means two extremes. For the many millions experiencing bipolar disorder around the world, life is split between two different realities, elation and depression. Although there are many variations of bipolar disorder, let's consider a couple. Type 1 has extreme highs alongside the lows, while type 2 involves briefer, less extreme periods of elation interspersed with long periods of depression. For someone seesawing between emotional states, it can feel impossible to find the balance necessary to lead a healthy life. Type 1's extreme highs are known as manic episodes, and they can make a person range from feeling irritable to invincible. But these euphoric episodes exceed ordinary feelings of joy, causing troubling symptoms like racing thoughts, sleeplessness, rapid speech, impulsive actions, and risky behaviors. Without treatment, these episodes become more frequent, intense, and take longer to subside. know that the kangaroo is a marsupial from the family Macropodidae. There are about 69 species of kangaroos in the world. They live in Australia, New Guinea and the nearby islands. Also everyone knows that kangaroo females have a special pouch where they carry their cubs. But not everyone knows that a kangaroo has a very short of pregnancy term. A baby is born about a month after conception. However, this is not a grown animal ready for life in the outside world. The size of a newborn kangaroo is only a couple of centimeters. And it weighs about a gram. In this embryonic state, the cub makes its way into the pouch, and a tiny kangaroo does not yet have hind legs, so he has to use the front ones. Moreover, the mother does not help him. She only licks the path to the pouch, for the cub immediately starts sucking on the nipple. Well, he doesn't actually suck it, because he is not yet able to. He is too small. Milk is secreted into his mouth with the help of a special muscle. Another particular thing about the kangaroo is that it has four nipples in his pouch. And each of them secretes a different kind of milk. So, kangaroos have four times of milk depending on the age of the cub. Sometimes a female has two cubs of different ages at once, and both are still in the pouch. In this case, two kinds of milks are secreted. In about 190 days, the cub becomes large and strong enough to climb out of the pouch. At first, he only sticks his head out. And this can continue for several weeks, until the cub feels safe enough to get out. He then starts spending more and more time in the outside world. And eventually in about 235 days, he lives in the pouch for the last time.
What I've learned is that the most effective people and teams in any domain do something we can all emulate. They go through life deliberately alternating between two zones, the learning zone and the performance zone. The learning zone is when our goal is to improve. Then we do activities designed for improvement, concentrating on what we haven't mastered yet, which means we have to expect to make mistakes, knowing that we will learn from them. That is very different from what we do when we're in our performance zone, which is when our goal is to do something as best as we can to execute. Then we concentrate on what we have already mastered and we try to minimize mistakes. Both of these zones should be part of our lives, but being clear about when we want to be in each of them, with what goal, focus and expectations, helps us better perform and better improve. The performance zone maximizes our immediate performance, while the learning zone maximizes our growth and our future performance. The reason many of us don't improve much despite our hard work is that we tend to spend almost all of our time in the performance zone. This hinders our growth, and ironically, over the long term, also our performance. In 2012, after reviewing the evidence, the American Medical Association released a major statement. Nightlight can disrupt your sleep cycle. However, for whatever reason, not many people have since been informed about it. So, here's the basics of what you need to know. When you're exposed to a significant amount of light, specifically of the blue wavelength, your body suppresses melatonin production to make you feel more awake. Normally, this evolutionary design works pretty well. With the coming of night and day, our melatonin levels waxes and wanes, giving us our circadian rhythm. However, since the invention of artificial lights, we're being exposed to more and more light at nighttime. And these effects can be pretty big. Here's what happens when you place participants in a room with similar brightness to your average household. This is where their melatonin levels would normally be if they were sleeping in a dark room. And here's their melatonin levels in that lit room. You can see the huge suppression of melatonin. And it doesn't take too much to see these effects either. How can sleep deprivation cause such immense suffering? Scientists think the answer lies with the accumulation of waste products in the brain. 
During our waking hours, our cells are busy using up our day's energy sources, which get broken down into various byproducts, including adenosine. As adenosine builds up, it increases the urge to sleep, also known as sleep pressure. In fact, caffeine works by blocking adenosine's receptor pathways. Other waste products also build up in the brain, and if they're not cleared away, they collectively overload the brain and are thought to lead to the many negative symptoms of sleep deprivation. So what's happening in our brain when we sleep to prevent this? Scientists found something called the glymphatic system, a cleanup mechanism that removes this buildup and is much more active when we're asleep. It works by using cerebrospinal fluid to flush away toxic byproducts that accumulate between cells. Lymphatic vessels, which serve as pathways for immune cells, have recently been discovered in the brain, and they may also play a role in clearing out the brain's daily waste products. While scientists continue exploring the restorative mechanisms behind sleep, we can be sure that slipping into slumber is a necessity if we want to maintain our health and our sanity. There is a lot of water on Mars and there once was a lot of surface flowing water. You don't see it because most of it is mixed with the soil which we call regolith on Mars. So the Martian soil can be anywhere from as little as 1% in some very dry desert-like areas to as much as 60% water. So one strategy for getting water when you're on Mars is to break up the regolith which would take something like a jackhammer because it's very cold, it's very frozen. If you can imagine making a frozen brick or a chunk of ice that's mostly soil and maybe half water and half soil that's what you would be dealing with. So you need to break this up, put it in an oven. As it heats up it turns to steam. You run it through a distillation tube and you have pure drinking water that comes out the other end. There is a much easier way to get water on Mars. In this country we have developed industrial dehumidifiers. And they're very simple machines that simply blow the air in a room or a building across a mineral called zeolite. Zeolite is very common on Earth. It's very common on Mars. And zeolite is kind of like a sponge. It absorbs water like crazy. Takes the humidity right out of the air. Then you squeeze it and out, comes the water.
A leader can define or clarify goals by issuing a memo or an executive order, an edict or a fatwa or a tweet, by passing a law, barking a command, or presenting an interesting idea in a meeting of colleagues. Leaders can mobilize people's energies in ways that range from subtle, quiet persuasion to the coercive threat or the use of deadly force. Sometimes a charismatic leader such as Martin Luther King Jr. can define goals and mobilize energies through rhetoric and the power of example. We can think of leadership as a spectrum, in terms of both visibility and the power the leader wields. On one end of the spectrum, we have the most visible, authoritative leaders like the President of the United States or the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, or a dictator such as Hitler or Gaddafi. At the opposite end of the spectrum is casual, low-key leadership found in countless situations every day around the world, leadership that can make a significant difference to the individuals whose lives are touched by it. Over the centuries, the first kind the out-in-front, authoritative leadership has generally been exhibited by men. Some men in positions of great authority, including Nelson Mandela, have chosen a strategy of leading from behind. More often, however, top leaders have been quite visible in their exercise of power. Women as well as some men have provided casual, low-key leadership behind the scenes. But this pattern has been changing, as more women have taken up opportunities for visible, authoritative leadership. Australia's location is important for the world's exports, and its international trade is also important. Since Australia has a large territory with vast, uninhabited areas, all towns are scattered around. This leads to huge expenses for transportation when using trains and ferries. The government also has to pay large amounts for its telecommunications to build up the catching between these regions. The Australian people are mainly living in five cities, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth and Brisbane and Adelaide. The most special one is Perth, which is one of the most isolated cities in the world. However, this does not affect its state to be one of the largest cities in Australia. Most large companies, like the two leading companies, Telstra and Qantas, they are both based in Perth. Human populations near the equator have evolved dark skin over many generations because of exposure to the fierce rays of the sun. A similar phenomenon has also occurred in other parts of the animal kingdom. 
The African grass mouse is a good example. Most mice are nocturnal, but the African grass mouse is active during daylight hours. This means that it spends its days searching for food in the semidry bush and scrub habitats of eastern and southern Africa. Its fur is striped, like a chipmunk's, which helps it blend in with its environment. Because it spends a lot of time in the intense tropical sun, the grass mouse has also evolved two separate safeguards against the sun's ultraviolet radiation. First, like the populations of humans in this region of the world, the skin of the grass mouse contains lots of melanin, or dark pigment. Second, and quite unusual, this mouse has a layer of melanin-pigmented tissue between its skull and skin. This unique cap provides an extra measure of protection for the grass mouse and three other types of African mouse-like rodents that are active during the day. The only other species scientists have identified with the same sort of skull adaptation is the white tent-making bat of the Central American tropics. Although these bats sleep during the day, they do so curled up with their heads exposed to the sun. <laughs> 